We've got a lot to get through today, as you'd imagine. But welcome to the WA Preventative Health Summit. My name's Griffin Longley. I'm the CEO of Nature Play WA, and I'll be your MC for today. Um, we're all here with a common purpose today, and it's to begin a really critical conversation for our community. But it's important for us to know right at the start that this is just the beginning of that conversation. It's not the end. During the summit, we're going to hear from some of the most compelling voices in public health on the twin problems of alcohol and obesity. Uh, and we're going to be inviting reflection on ways we might make meaningful progress and spur concerted action. Our agenda is absolutely packed. Uh, there'll be a lot of voices on stage, in the room, and joining in across the, straight, the state. Um, so one thing that's going to mean is we're not going to have time to hear from everyone, of course. But please know that your questions and comments made through the social media platform that I'll introduce you to shortly will be pulled together and captured, and they'll help inform a summary report uh, that will be available to all. Um, with all of that said, I'd like to welcome a truly Mordich Yorga, Ingrid Cumming, to, to come up and do the Welcome to Country. Kaya Mam and Yoga Yao calling Nicha Maya Niningwa, Nang Ingrid Cumming, Nang Wajat Nunga Yoga, Nang Da Wanking Nuna Wa, Nang Yira Weirin Wa, Jenning Yira Nang Nuna, Jenning Ku Nicha Bujawa. Pretty good, eh? Uh, so, uh, I am Ingrid Cumming, I'm a Wajak Nunga woman and I'm one of the uh, very many custodians and traditional owners that represent this particular area. I'm here today with the uh, blessing of my old people and the, the resilience and the love and strength that they give the next generation to carry on our very important ceremonies like Welcome to Country. I'd like to warmly welcome you all here today on Country and share with you a song that comes from a place called Kala Marda. And if you uh, are from Perth and you say Kala Marda with more of an Aussie accent, it sounds a bit like Kalamanda. <laughs> so we actually all speak uh, a lot more Nyunga than what we realise if um, you've noticed walking around Perth and some of the suburbs and different places. So Kalamunda was known as a place where people uh, from all over the southwest and Yungar country would come and share and ceremony, a lot of wedding ceremonies would happen up there. It's a very special place, but the song reflects uh, the coming together of all different people for a greater good, as you were all sitting here doing the same thing today. So I'm going to share with you this song, and then after the song, um, I'll leave you with a special message. Today's song is dedicated to my pop happy. I have to leave very shortly after to get to Brookton to say farewell to him. Um, so I dedicate this song to him today. That, uh, thank you. Uh, the song uh, says, Welcome to Country. This is the place of our spiritual ancestors, our family, and our future. And we ask uh, the spirits to look over all of you as you sit here together, connecting here on our, your country. I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, so I've worked in health for a long, long time, and many of my client, old clients, actually, I see in the room too. Um, but it's uh, not an easy area to work in, the area of health, and, and I thank you all for your commitment to it. Uh, but it is really true uh, when you look at someone like me with a mum who's actually Russian-English and a father who is Nyunga Dutch. Uh, so I'm the physical form of a black Russian. How good is that? <laughs> Which is funny given the theme of today, actually. <laughs> uh, so, mum and dad, many, many years ago, obviously met, and uh, in a time in this country where it was actually illegal for them to have a relationship and be together. Um, but what they believed in was their cart court wear and their head heart and their spirit. And me standing here today, and you all sitting here together, uh, as, is proof that when Indigenous and non Indigenous people come together, clearly beautiful things can be created. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> 
in the spirit of reconciliation and moving forward together, particularly in the area of health, I say one June Nitjanyunga Buja. Welcome to our country and have a wonderful summit here today. Thank you. A beautiful thing indeed. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, I would now like to welcome the Honourable Mr Roger Cook, Deputy Premier and Minister for Health and Mental Health, to formally open this summit. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Griffin. Thank you, every, uh, everyone. Uh, for coming along today to lend your minds, your bodies, your souls, and your, um, and your good thoughts. Can I begin by, first of all, just acknowledging uh, the Wajak people of the proud Noongar Nation. Uh, I'd want to join all of you in acknowledging their elders past and present and, um, and give thanks for being able to share this country with them. Ingrid um, it always provides a wonderful welcome to country and was a terrific way to start. Can I begin also by acknowledging um, some folk here today? And um, I want to begin by in particular acknowledging my, my good friend and colleague, Janine Freeman, MLA, uh, member for uh, Mirabuka and chair of the Education and Health Standing Committee. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, Dr. David Russell Vice, Director General of the Department of Health, and of course, Tim Marnie, the uh, Mental Health Commissioner. Ms. Susan Hunt, Executive Director of Healthway and CEO of Lotteries West, welcome. Uh, Ms. Robin Cruck, uh, Chair of the Sustainable um, Health Review Panel, uh, thank you for coming along today. And Mr. Warren Harding, Minister, the Minister for Health's nominee on the Sustainable Health Review Panel. Um, great to have you here, Warren. Also to welcome our, some of our keynote speakers, Mr. Barry Sanderson, uh, Director of the Australian um, Institute of Health and Welfare, Ms. Uh, Jane Martin, the, uh, uh, from the Obesity uh, Policy Coalition, Mr. Don Jonathan Karapides. Jonathan, always great to have you um, supporting these forums, and Mr. Steve Alsop. Uh, is, uh, who we'll be hearing from later. It's terrific to have him here as well. Um, thank you, as I said, thank you very much everyone uh, for coming along here today. Thank you also to all of those who are watching online here and welcome to the Preventative Health Summit. This summit is a McGowan government uh, initiative to help improve the health of Western Australians. We recently launched the interim report of the Sustainable Health Review key feature of that is that um, we are not going to resolve health issues in Western Australia by jamming more people into hospitals. It's by improving the health and well-being of West Australians so they don't have to go to hospitals in the first place. I'd like to thank those of you in the room here today who have taken the time to come and join in this important conversation as individuals with a professional and personal interest and influence in health improvement. I welcome all your contributions. I would also like to welcome people from all over the state who are watching and listening to the discussion as it happens. Your thoughts and opinions are also highly valued and I encourage you, please, send in your comments and questions that we'll be uh, facilitating throughout the day. Last year when I announced this summit, I said it would focus on two of the greatest public uh, health challenges facing our state. That is how we curb the rise of obesity, and how to reduce the harms due to alcohol use. These are not only the issues we face, but everyone would agree they are pressing and are in need for urgent action. We are also concerned about the ongoing damage tobacco use does in our community. The government already has an agenda to tighten up uh, tobacco control with a bill currently before the parliament. Improving mental health is also a major concern and the Mental Health Commission recently launched a campaign titled Think Mental Health, which is part of a broader mental health promotion and mental illness and alcohol and drug prevention plan to be released later this year. More information on this will be available in the coming months. The problems associated with methamphetamine use within the community also continue to be an ongoing issue. Through the Methamphetamine Action Plan, the State Government will continue to target uh, continued targeted action to reduce amphetamine demand, supply and most importantly from a public health perspective, harm. But today is about obesity and alcohol and we are fortunate to have with us some of Australia's leading thinkers in both fields. 
We also have our highly regarded local public health experts who know and understand the differences that make the state of Western Australia so unique. I'm not going to shock you with the numbers. Our plenary speaker, Barry Sanderson, will do that for us in, in glorious detail, I'm sure. Um, and he'll be updating us in a few minutes. It is enough for me to say that the impact of obesity and alcohol use on the community is staggering in terms of sickness, disability, impact on families and carers, cost to the hospital system, cost to the overall economy, and of course, early and preventable death. The key word is preventable, and that is the focus of today. What needs to be done to keep Western Australians well and out of hospitals in the first place? What can be done by, the, by various levels of government? How can business, organisations and institutions be involved? How do we support families and individuals to keep, to keep healthy? The McGowan government came into office with a strong commi commitment to prevention. We have already undertaken steps on tobacco law reform, improved preventive health education for young Aboriginal people, and strengthening mental health initiatives across the community, including in rural and regional areas. We've also introduced new vaccination programs to protect our youngest West Australians from infectious disease. And we are supporting getting kids and adults alike on their bikes, literally, by increasing investment in Perth cycleways and providing grants to local governments for, uh, uh, for their own tailored cycling um, activities. And we have a broader body of work that we are trying to uh, pull together through the Metronet uh, network around Metro Hubs, which is about creating active, more vibrant and, and um, cohesive communities to continue to improve the, uh, the built environment to, to lend support to active, healthy lives. The state government's Healthways has already made some great, some great inroads in reducing kids' exposure to alcohol and unhealthy food and promoting healthy lifestyles at many WA venues by working in partnership with sporting, arts and community organisations. One of the particular policy areas that I've asked to hear more about today is how having a minimum floor price for alcohol could impact on harmful drinking. I'm confident that a range of ideas will arise from today's conversations, and I'm looking forward to hearing, the, the, hearing practical, real-world responses to these questions. The outcomes of today's summit will be of great personal interest to me and the government as well. They will also be presented to the Sustainable Health Review Panel, which will be reporting later this week, this year, on future directions to our health system. Questions and comments made by members of the audience here in the room and online will also be noted. Therefore, if your question is not directly raised or answered, I can assure you that it will be collated and considered and be part of the feedback that we generate from, from today's um, conversation. Finally, I'm also putting the challenge out to everybody in this room and watching around the state to think long and hard about what you can do to influence community's health for the better. Whether it is at home, at work, with your clubs and community groups, or in our businesses, organisations and institutions. I've mentioned that several times in the lead up to the Preventative Summit that we have both a role of leadership and also of a role around conversations and taking the community with us. I'm looking forward to the Preventative, uh, the preventative Health Summit being a catalyst for continuing a vibrant conversation and informing government and the community about what we can do into the future to continue to improve the lives, the health and wellbeing of Western Australians because we are looking at big, complicated issues today. And we all have a role to play and a responsibility to step up, be it by adopting your own healthy behaviour, encouraging others to do the same and supporting those policy changes that can make a difference. I'm delighted now to declare the WA Preventive Health Summit Action on Obesity and Alcohol, What Needs to Change, officially open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. So we've got a bit of housekeeping to go through quickly. The first one is just going over the schedule um, in, in brief. 
First thing to know is that the day is divided into the morning and afternoon sessions, with the morning being focused on obesity and the afternoon focused on alcohol. Also, please everyone be aware that every session from now on is going to be followed by a Q&A. So be engaged, be thinking, be ready to share your questions. Uh, so in the morning, we're going to start with an introductory plenary, followed by a morning tea break at 10.20. Um, and then we'll have an obesity plenary, again, followed by a Q&A, and then a panel discussion, and then a conversation with Pro Professor Jonathan Karapides, uh, and then we'll have lunch at 1.10. In the afternoon, we've got an alcohol plenary, a panel discussion. Again, we'll be hearing from Professor Karapides, uh, and then we'll have the wind-up at 4.20. So a lot to get through. In terms of direct housekeeping, um, unusually, please turn your phones on. Um, and then turn them to silent, if you wouldn't mind. That important detail to follow. Um, in case of an emergency, please listen to the library staff for direction. Bathrooms, including accessible bathrooms, are located across the foyer to the right. Uh, morning tea and lunch will be served in the foyer. So now, Introducing Slido, which is the social media app platform we're going to be using for questions today. Um, so let's have a look at that. It allows us to submit our questions throughout the sessions, even while people are speaking, you can be putting questions up there. You'll be able to see the questions others have raised as they come up on your device, and you can upvote them. Simply click on the thumbs up icon and that'll push it up and give it more, that question, more likelihood of being answered. So we're submitting questions and we're clicking on the questions we think are important that we want to get elevated in the discussion. Um, okay, so let's get signed on to that. The first thing is Wi-Fi. You'll notice that the uh, network, oh no, it's not there anymore, um, and the password. So the, the network is SLWA functions. And the password, and this is in the middle of your um, catalogue for today, is brush with a capital B, voice with a capital V, dollar sign 71. No idea how that was arrived at, but that's what it is. Okay, so I'm just going to grab my notes from over here because I left them. Forgive me. So if you wouldn't mind opening your web browser, that might be Safari or whatever you're using, and type in www.slido.com. And when you've done that, I'll give you a second. If you could enter hashtag WA with capitals, health with a capital, and summit with a capital. WA Health Summit. Once you've got that up, you can enter questions throughout the session. They will, of course, only be addressed during the Q&A session. Because we're limited to, in time, we'll do our best to address as many as possible. But again, they will all be logged um, and go into a report at the end of the event. Also, please know that while there is the opportunity to put comments, only questions will be raised in this session for the speakers to reply to. So with all that done, it's my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for the morning session, Mary Faton. Mary's a well-known and loved broadcaster and podcaster who has a deep personal interest in health and well-being. Welcome, Mary. Thanks, Griffin. I had to laugh when Ingrid Cumming was talking about the, the Black Russian because I had this moment of... Uh, I, you can see my name up there. It's, it's pronounced Phaeton, but it's fat in, obviously. And it did cross my mind that that was slightly appropriate. Clearly, the agenda today is fat out. Um, but anyway, it's my pleasure to be here and to introduce uh, our introductory plenary with Mr Barry Sanderson, who is the director of the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. With 35 years experience across more than 13 public sector agencies, including youth, family and income support, Barry Sanderson's expertise covers a wide range of health and welfare related areas but he's at pains to point out that he's an enthusiastic interpreter of statistics, not a data expert per se. 
Barry was appointed director of the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare in June 2016 and has dedicated his time to facilitating better use of data and analytics within the public service and advocating for better public use and access. Please welcome Barry Sanderson. Thank you very much, Mary. And, uh, I know Ingrid had to go, but uh, a special thanks to Ingrid. That was a, a great welcome to country. And I would like to uh, acknowledge the Indigenous people on whose land we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to uh, comment to the Minister, who's also just left. Um, I will have some numbers, but one of the things that I'll focus on is about the value of evidence and the value of data. As an organisation, we have uh, about 400 people just now. We've grown by about 27% over the last year or so. Um, there's a bit of a wave of data and evidence being okay to talk about. It's not, not just nerdy. Data scientists would say it's the sexiest job in the world. I don't know if they have the stats to back it up, but it's a statement, probably more a declaration, not evidence. But one of the key things that uh, I will prompt you with is about that value and your responsibilities for everybody in the room about data, evidence, and how you use it or how you go and seek it, particularly, obviously, in the area of preventative health. The other thing that I'd say is that uh, if you have stronger evidence, you potentially can get better decisions, and then you potentially can get improved health and welfare. And for us at the Institute, that's actually our vision statement, and our bit is the stronger evidence. So. Um, with that in mind, there are three parts that I want to run through today. A, uh, a conversation on a few more issues about the value of evidence and data. And then uh, in the keeping of the, uh, the online approach being used, um, a little survey. We'll create some data today. That won't take too long and it's not too daunting. It's a quick click and my guys have told me that I won't look a fool and it's all going to work. Um, <laughs> that was a, a promise. I was somewhat nervous on that. And then, of course, I'll give you some data. But the reason I'm not going to load up with lots of data, you'll probably have other people there. And the bottom line is that stuff you can get from the website. I could email those out to you. You could all read them at your leisure, hopefully. But the issue is about making the point on critical issues. Because if you don't have data with evidence turned into information, then with some consideration, it just sits there as a spreadsheet, as a chart. It's actually got to be used by people. And the role of data organisations are about enabling others to achieve their strategic goals. And that's very much the role for the Institute. So to me, number one point, what's our challenge? Our has to be a group effort. It has to be researchers. It has to be policymakers, service delivery people. It's politicians, leaders, administrators. It is not just some data people who do some work with data. It's about the connectedness across all of those areas. The other thing that is thinking that data is an asset. What is the investment that is being made in data and not as the afterthought? Quite often what happens at the end of rail, something's not working, and the question comes of, well, what data do we have on X, Y, and Z? It could well be a month late, a year late, 10 years too late, in terms of providing the sort of information that you need to make good decisions and improve health outcomes. And particularly for preventative health, if you're going to look into that area, it's also about linked data the interplay of different data sets and the connectedness between different data sets. And in there, it's not just health data. It's across all the different areas of social policy and the different elements of social policy that you need to look through to understand what's happening in one area and could be a causal link to something else or the repercussions somewhere else. Or if you really want to just step a little bit away from pure health, it's about the money and the money flow and the costs. On Wednesday this week, we released a, a report that I'm particularly proud of on family and domestic violence. It's the first national report on family and domestic violence. There's been plenty of other reports done, but we went out and spent over a year with a small team, dragging data out of 20 different areas to put into a consolidated volume. And one of our key roles that we've picked up over the last nine or 10 months when we rebranded the Institute was looking at where the data gaps are not just what's there. The legacy of the Institute should be that we actually, as an independent agency, can actually step outside some of the boundaries of the public service. And after 35 years in the public service and heading towards retirement, 
a little bit of a gloat there um, uh, for the younger people in the audience. But um, I'm in a position where, with the Institute and protection under legislation for our independence, we can actually go and bring together data and put it out there, not to criticise policy or criticise outcomes or service delivery. We stay away from evaluation. Our job is to build a baseline of evidence that can let others have a debate that is actually based on an improved level of evidence. All of you would have seen debates and discussions that happen that are based on a narrow slice of information, one particular line of data from one particular report. And Blind Freddy could see that if you went to a different page and looked at another line, you could probably find a bit of data that went in the opposite way. Our job is to bring data together from a variety of sources and actually get it out there, so 99% of what we do is published, and actually have it there for public debate, public consumption. But one of the issues that we have to learn more about at the Institute is how that evidence is used and directed by practitioners, by service delivery organisations and policy makers to make sure it is of value. Otherwise we could do the 150 reports a year that we do, put them all on a bookshelf. They probably look pretty good and would be very proud, but it doesn't mean that it's helping anything. And again, back to stronger evidence, better decisions, improved health and well-being. The only way that the evidence can help is if it's out there, if it's brought together. And the only way it can actually really push for the better decisions is if it's actually put in front of people from a variety of different players. Unfortunately, so often evidence is used, again, branded or picked up for particular purposes and not used in a holistic way. The reason why I raised the example of family and domestic violence was clearly alcohol as a, an area to play in family and domestic violence, both before and after. It also is a link to burden of disease and is a key driver of burden of disease, up there with smoking and alcohol. So when you talk about burden of disease and you look at evidence, you look at other social issues. Frequently there'll be conversations about the social determinants of health. I try and avoid that at the Institute. It's the social determinants of everything. Because each data set, if you stop and look and do the linkages, you find the pathways that people, our citizens, take through a variety of social, social policy areas and end up falling foul of systems, be it welfare systems, be it health systems, or purely from a health viewpoint, we can't bring to bear the kind of data sets that are needed that could help them. And genomics is a really good example about how, by better use of data and bringing data together, you can actually start looking very early on at rare diseases and how you might be able to help people with early identification and early intervention. And if you want to get, again, back to the, the nub of and save money. One of the really interesting things that I've found after years in health and welfare, prior to joining the Institute, I ran Medicare. I spent a couple of years there. Before that, I was over on the Centrelink side, so I was in welfare. And uh, before that, did a bit in income support, family policy. I was the child support registrar for a while. That's a bit of a no-win. If you get at least half the people thinking your decisions are okay, you're doing really, really well. Um, and before that, employment policy. And my job was to implement policy about single parents and people with partial capacity to work and disability. Not the most uh, topical thing to actually own up to, but it gives you a sign and a view across the broad stretch of public policy issues, social policy issues, and how interconnected they all are. So breaking down the silos is a key part of what I think we are all about. If you stop and think about preventative health, don't look at just the silo of your area, look across the various areas of health, but also beyond health itself. Now, a couple of um, little specific things. Today, investment models in health. It fascinates me that the health system has so much data, incredibly powerful data, but talks about health outcomes. Now, that sounds, again, like probably pretty silly. Of course, we talk about health outcomes. The welfare system, whose data is pretty ordinary at best, has spent years trying to work out what is the investment model or investment models that could be used to reduce the cost of welfare and interpret welfare really broadly. At the state level, it's foster care, it's community services, juvenile justice, you name it. At the Commonwealth level, it's interpreted mainly as income support. And they try to use investment models of what can early intervention do to stop $20 billion worth of expense over two decades, three decades, four decades. I don't hear nearly the same conversation in the health side of things, where there is far better data, long-term data that's been around for ages, 
but it's just a really interesting issue that I absolutely get if the focus is on health and health outcomes. But if you want to win a debate with finance and treasury, you've got to have your finance outcomes in there as well. You've got to have the argument about what it's going to save. That's a reality of a multi-billion dollar health system that's growing and growing well beyond CPI. So it's those silos and those practical realities. There is no pure part of the system of preventative health that you can just say, well, look at this and that will have the silver bullet. It's about the linkages between all of those and having people that have enough understanding and can step beyond the boundaries of the silos to actually look into those sorts of areas. The Institute of Health and Welfare, just a little plug, a partner organisation, 55% of our work is cost recovered. So we're not just funded by government and sit there and do what we want to do and hope somebody thinks it's useful. Our focus is on how we deliver work that is of use to jurisdictions, to individual organisations. And over the last six months, we've had some great conversations with the not-for-profit sector. So the nature of the organisation is changing about, if there's evidence there, 150 reports, 100 plus collections that we access or hold to. We have 340 or 50 of the staff are involved directly in data-related activities. 150 of those are PhDs or masters in epidemiology, sciences, economics, statistics, and so on. So there's a capability that as an institute, we've kept ourselves hidden in the main and just get on and do what we do. But we want to talk about what the capability can do to help others. Our job is not to sit there and do stuff, it's to enable others and get the direction and the input from stakeholders. Our key goals are to be leaders in health and welfare data, drivers of data quality and improvements, experts who add value through analysis, champions for open and accessible data, and trusted and independent. And that's the critical part for us, that if you don't have trust with data, you get nowhere. Because you need to have people, organisations agreeing to the access to the data. And again, Australia falls behind in a discussion around the social licence about the value of data, access to data, data linkage and so on. There's a lot that we need to do in those sorts of areas. So. I'll move on to the next stage, but the reminder, our responsibilities jointly in this room and beyond are about building capability. I'm one-eyed, of course it's going to be about evidence and data, but it's building capability about understanding the data, knowing who it is in your organisation that does the data work. Working out what is the question you ask of a data person, you do not leave it to the data person to ask the question of the data. I've been on both sides of the fence and you can get lost in the wilderness of numbers and spreadsheets for many, many years if you don't clarify what it is that you're trying to solve, what the issues are. If you're a leader, you've got to be out there leading the understanding about investment in evidence and data. And the unfortunate thing, it's like a lot of things, it's investment. It costs more up front to do some of those things, but later on, you get the benefits. So with that, into data creation point. So, um, I'm hoping now we can move to Menti. I'm not looking there, but I should be looking over there. So if you can go to the website at the top, menti.com, nice and easy. And it's just that six digit code. There are just gonna be half a dozen quick questions and you just vote on them. And we will see the answers the results coming up. It's all anonymous, so we're not tracking back to your phones to see who puts the knife into a particular issue. But if we've got a reasonable number going, we might go to the, the first question. No, we'll go back. It's still up there. So the, the code is still up there. 950633. Oh, that's good. So there's lots of, are we ready? We've 36 and climbing. We'll give it a couple of seconds. So far, my team's promise has come true. That's good. They told me it was the graphics was the fun part, rather than just what the answers are. It's just they sit there watching that the numbers go up when we were doing the trial. Okay, at any point, um, we'll go to the, next qu the, the first question. At any point, if you're not quite in, you'll catch up. 
So I thought I'd start with a WA question. And uh, it was, uh, as with everything, it's what question, what answer do you expect to get? A number of people told me, because I'm a Swans supporter um, and big on AFL, they said, you've got to have a not interested. Because <laughs> funnily enough, a lot of people in my organisation aren't interested, <laughs> despite my regular newsletters talking about football. Um, so if you can get in there, to that, hopefully that first question has come up. There you go. <laughs> Gee, okay. Hmm. Gee. I told them to get a conversation going. I can leave now. Yeah, have a good rest of the day. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. All right. So, now we're into something a little bit more interesting. And this, hopefully, there obviously will be some people in the room that might have read our report, so you're going to go, I know what the answer is. But for others, you're going to be guessing. And it will give us a bit of a perspective on perception versus evidence. And uh, there's a few people taking far too long. This is gut reaction. It's like Trivial Pursuit. Go with your first thought <laughs> and whack it in there. I think last time we had about 120 or so, so I think once we get up over, that's pretty good. And it is very interesting that people in their 50s, in 2010, 9.1% had 11 drinks a month, but in 2016, the number had gone up to 11.9%. So it is the older age groups, well done. Um, and if you get into the people in their 60s, they went from 4.7% having 11 drinks a month to 6.1%. So it is the over 50 group, particularly, it's not in the younger area. So um, we won't make people stand up and say, what answer did you give to this question? <laughs> we'll move on to the next one. And all of these will be emailed to you or uh, be given access back afterwards. So the system provides a, a summary of it, so I'm told. So why do you think now there will be words, a couple of words in here, so this takes a little bit longer, but if you have a look at those again, don't overthink it. And as you, oh, somebody's put their code in there. <laughs> so as you put in the different words, the word cloud will emphasize whatever has the most and it will sit in the middle there and everything else will get framed so it gives a sort of an instant perspective. Look, it would have been just as easy with numbers in a chart, but it was just something different. So that's pretty interesting in the context of some of the public conversation and the political conversation about alcohol and what some of the issues are around drinking and the implications around drinking. But it, it's only interesting insofar as your perception rather than perhaps what people are actually doing. So there you go. It's, Primarily, over and over, has come through in cost. Just a couple more if we go to the next one. Come on, fess up. No debt. My guys went through and said, okay, because we're, we're a data organisation. So there's, what do you mean by vigorous? I said, if I have to go into that, we've lost the plot <laughs> anyway. But, you know, and then they gave me the caveats to read out to say vigorous means to, I said, no, no, no. I think people can make up their own minds and it's a, it's a bit of fun and it's a bit of data creation. And it is interesting that one of our reports that we put out in relation to exercise um, and obesity did talk about the burden of disease and what 15 minutes a day of additional vigorous exercise maintained, key question, not for a week and then back to the bottle at night, um, it was very much based on that, the burden of disease because what we wanted to do was actually try and give something that was a hook in what we call, you know, you hear a lot about the pub conversation, pub English, the pub test. Our data came out and it talked about if you change one unit in body mass and so on, my question is, well, what the hell is that? You know, where do I get the knife to cut that off to say, good, I'm all good now? And they went away and they said, well, actually, for the average person, average overweight, obese person, it's about three kilos. I said, well, that's the message. 
It's not one unit of body mass. You guys might all say, oh yeah, I know what that is, that's good. But when you're putting out information to try and make an impact and have understanding and get a social license for what you're trying to do, and if you're looking at preventative health, you have to work out the data and the stats and all of the, the science side of it, but work out how it is that you're going to communicate that to different stakeholders. And part of our job is working out how to communicate data to different stakeholders to let them go away and hopefully make some really good decisions into the future. Okay, we'll flick to it. One more. This will be an interesting one. And it's interesting that the, we ask it in relation to WA, but the WA and the national figures are actually very similar. So it's not that different. The interesting one is that uh, the only one actually where, is, where uh, WA is above the national average on these is um, alcohol. So um, there's a little thread in there for today about why that would be, and I have some other data a bit later. And the answer is uh, tobacco, 7.9%. So despite the data around younger people being less um, likely to be smoking and less likely to be involved in alcohol and so on, the smoking numbers of the older people are staying pretty steady. Basically the exit from smoking for older people is when they die. The drop off in numbers of people stopping smoking isn't there. The drop off is in people taking up smoking in the first place and the younger cohort. So it's a really interesting part of a conversation if you look at the alcohol stuff by age and the smoking by age, but then a perception about younger people and binge drink. Again, it's all dependent on is it once a year and they have the big session with 20 drinks or the 11 or the two a week or whatever it might be. So all back to definitions. But perceptions come across, across so strongly, particularly in media, but also in policy discussions at times when the evidence doesn't stack up in the same way. And then the last one, this is for you today, to give you a little bit of uh, feedback. I'll just remind you again, it, yeah, it's all anonymous. None of this comes back to find your IP address. And Is that because it's frozen or everyone's thinking hard? Is it? Oh, that's a, it failed me on the last one. Oh well. We'll move on, that's a shame. Oh well, I get a, I was right when I go back. <laughs> All right. Oh. Oh. It's too late. I've already sent the message. With some of the whispering, I should have said, you shouldn't talk to other people, it's your answer. Don't, don't negotiate a combined answer with other people. Anyway, that's for your use. So look, um, I'll now uh, leap in to do a run through. Now I've got some slides here, I'm gonna race through them because I think question time, um, as I said, I'm not into the data per se of uh, memorizing lots and lots of stats. But um, I think the, the, cre the, the key issue for me is to give you a bit of information. The Institute is available to engage on this. There's probably a lot of you in the room that have had some form of engagement with the Institute anyway. But, um, okay. So Australians and alcohol. Three in four drank alcohol at some point in the past year. That's a uh, little change from 2013. Males are more likely than females to drink. 
and the people aged 70, can, 70 and over can, uh, continue to be the group most likely to drink daily. Interesting in looking at the uh, proportion of people aged 14 or older who drank alcohol. So again, the data shows that it is improving. It is based on survey information, but uh, the interesting one, 25 to 29 year olds are the ones most likely to take action about their drinking habits. So if you're trying to break a cycle and not looking at we want to change it for next year's results, but look at the long term, and if you look at preventative and early investment, there are particular age groups where you can have an impact with your dollars, but it might take a longer time to work through the system. But that's the same with most social policy issues. You've got to work out where you get your investment in, be it money, be it effort, be it thinking. In this one, alcohol and violence incidents. Just a little reminder about how interrelated things are, that they don't just sit there in their silos. It's the crossovers. But one in three incidents of violence from an intimate partner, alcohol was involved. Again, no surprises to people, I'm sure. But it's starting to get data and evidence in place to actually point at things. Most data will not give you the aha uh -huh moment. It'll say, well, that's what I knew. But it's what you knew quite often through perception, through experience. The social worker stories will give lots of information that gets eventually backed up by evidence. But occasionally there are variants to that or ways in which you can track people through a system. Three in 10 incidents of other family violence are alcohol related. Who's drinking too much? I've already talked about that one. But um, it's the, the spike at the end. But um, overall, the older age groups are showing the uh, stable and increasing patterns of consumption. And the younger age groups are showing the decreasing trends. So while they're high, it's the decreasing trends. So it's working out what it is the trigger that's doing that. And again, that little bit you did with the word cloud, is it money, whatever it might be? Is it peer group pressure? What is it that's changing? Is it just they're not going out drinking as much because they're sitting at home on social media? That pops up every now and then that people aren't out and about as much. There's different surveys that could be done to follow through to find out more information. What's happening in WA? No really surprises in there, but basically it's interesting the changes that are happening across the board with alcohol. So one of the, the key things that we've found is trying to break down the data sets below jurisdictional level, below national level and below jurisdictional level, getting into primary healthcare network level and so on. So the geographic side of data, um, there's plenty of talk about spatial data. It's great. It's wonderful to have dots on the maps but it's looking at what questions that data can help you answer that is critical and whether you can target particular activities and responses. So in WA, risky drinking. So again, once you get the data and break it up, it's not the same message, even though some of the percentages are maybe seen as relatively minor, Having the same message across the board, be it national or be it state or be it localised, is not necessarily the answer. There will be different areas where different messages are needed. So into the uh, overweight and obesity. It's just the change there pushing to the right. 65% of Australian adults are overweight or obese. So if you want to look at it in straight numbers, 11.2 million people an increase from 56% in 1995. And for a local flavour, so out of the uh, 31 PHNs when we did this work, country South Australia was the, uh, the highest, heaviest, and Northern Sydney the other end, and there are uh, two of the three PHNs from WA. As I said, I'm going through these because you can get the data. There's, there's so much more that's around. So again, looking at WA and the breakup there of the three PHNs. This one I'm not even going to begin to try and talk through. It's more a description of how we use data and the burden of disease work. So the original burden of disease work that led to a report in 2016 was based on 2011 data. As soon as that came out, 
um, we were funded to then go and update the data to 2015 data. It's not something you do every year, but the burden of disease data allows for in-depth analysis across a whole range of different issues. And in here, looking at some of the crossovers, it's this sort of thing that starts getting into where do you look at how to target your work, what other questions you might ask of other data sets, but the measure of burden of disease allows you to look at things in a comparative nature. Again, stepping outside the silos, looking at things from a different angle. Weight and chronic conditions and their prevalence. Each time when we look at these sorts of data sets, it gives information for somebody out there to think of things slightly differently, but to also look at how they might approach a particular issue. And occasionally, in some of these areas, when you do burden of disease, you do get aha uh -huh moments from the data. It's not the same as a, uh, no, that's what I thought. I've been in this field for 20 years. Sometimes there are things in here, as you dig into data more and more, that you'll actually uncover things that really do start changing the way you think about things, whether you're a practitioner, a researcher, a policymaker. And that's what we look to try and do, is get that data out there for others to make use of. Populations more at risk, no big surprises. How much obesity costs? That was from PwC in 2015. I don't think anybody is uh, hiding away from the fact that we know both alcohol and obesity cost a huge amount of money to society through a variety of systems and whether it's People stay longer on welfare, people don't pay as much tax because they can't work as much, whatever it might be, or straight onto the health system, there's a multitude of issues where it builds up a burden of finance costs on society. What can we do? This is the small changes, so the body mass index, and three kilos. So um, the really interesting thing here is so much data is based on um, data sources that have been around for a while and it's how do we get into new data sources, find new data that we can link to existing data sources to actually look beyond what we've known for some time. And while the evidence is useful to know through fact certain issues, what we really need is how can we uncover new linkages in particular areas to actually give a sign for people to explore different approaches or different early intervention activities. And that's one of the things that we want to try and do with the Institute is how do we actually examine different data sets I would love to get to the point where we can see beyond the very structured data sets that we primarily deal with. Primary healthcare is almost a, a non-data set in Australia um, in terms of a national position, and that's one of the key issues for the Institute over the next, I won't even say one year, over the coming years, is to take a, a lead role in working on primary healthcare. That we have a national data asset in the hospital's data set. We can link that to the MBS and to the PBS, so you get an amazing crossover to the death register, but primary health care sits there almost as a vacuum. And when you think about early intervention, preventative activity, what are doctors doing, it's quite amazing that we don't have a national investment looking at that kind of activity. And then just a little one, this is where we sit. where WA would sit. It's always interesting to look at other countries and think, well, would you have thought that, or why is that so? But also to go and try and find out, well, what are some other countries doing, or just what's in their background of the nature of how they look at approaches to food, food regulation, whatever it might be. And interestingly enough, I just thought I'd throw this one in because no matter what you do, sometimes things don't quite work out as planned. So there we were with a goal and we went backwards. So yes, you can measure things and it's good, but then do we actually respond to what the measurement is saying? Or is it just, well, that was good to have a target, shame it didn't happen, now let's move on to what next? Versus how, what's the, the call to arms? So to bring it all back, it doesn't matter whether you're analysing, modelling, measuring, leading, interpreting, whatever it is that you might be doing, where do you fit within the understanding about data, its value, 
the role of evidence in the work that you do every day, who the people are that actually manage the data for you, what kind of investment that you do, but particularly what's our, our responsibility jointly about building capability. So it might not be there now. It might be the area that the first thing when you put a budget initiative through and uh, the call is, no, it's got to be reduced by 10 or 20%, it's too much. It's, oh, well, how about we cut off the evaluation? We can trim out the data stuff. We want to have people on the ground doing stuff. I've been through plenty of those. 12 o'clock fights with the midnight fights with the Department of Finance, arguing about half of an ASL, a person who was going to be doing something, losing the 100 grand that was going to do the evaluation work to find out what bloody worked. It's better to just do something and in five years we'll say, oh, it didn't really work as planned, but we'll come up with a new one. The investment in evidence can only be argued properly if you can demonstrate the value of the evidence in the first place and the use of data. And for a forum like this, that was my message to all of you as much as the issue around what the data is saying. Most of you would know to a greater or lesser extent what the data says. The issue is now there is a debate in Australia and more broadly about data. It's okay to talk about it. It's actually being talked about more about evidence trails. So to me, the, the message is we're on top of a wave. If you're in the data world, you're on top of it. Don't get under it, stay on top of the wave, ride it in, and it's a carpe diem, seize the day. And um, you know, data's good. I did make the mistake once with uh, a previous minister of saying the joy of data. She never let me live that one down. <laughs> um, and it was probably pretty wanky. Um, <laughs> A really bad choice of words and everything, but I can't even remember the context, but it, was a, uh, it still was the right intent that there's a lot more to data than most people recognise, but we need people to understand that and make the effort to make sure those that are doing the data actually have the support and the input from the users of it to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Barry. Um, before we start with the questions that have come through on Slido, I just want to go back to one of the questions in your, in your survey, um, to which many people responded uh, either fair or good. How, I think I've got this right. How well do, do you think you're using evidence to support preventive health in WA? So uh, the practical question is then, like, what do people not know about how to use the Institute to gather this information and to create the alchemy that brings that information to them? Um, look, a couple of things. I'll put a, a lot of the onus has been on us as an organisation talking about capability and explaining what the capability is. If you don't know what's there, you don't know what to ask for. So part of our job is to engage more broadly with a range of people. Is that better? Um, but I think the particular thing is, is understanding how data gets used. And we're in a world now where there is far more data linkage. And it used to be here is a data set, what do the numbers show? And the little charts come up with that sort of thing. But if you look at the data linkages, you can actually demonstrate a heck of a lot more. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples has been the work, uh, if you think if you had aged care data and you had hospital data, and you can go in and have a look, de-identified of course, the whole thing is about it's anonymised information, but you link it, use separation principles, and then you can go and see how many um, people from aged care homes have gone into hospital. Anecdotally, you'd know that there's a reasonable number. But if you start looking at the numbers, you can say, well, there's a hospital, uh, there's an ambulance trip, because quite often it's by ambulance. There's then hospital when it might be emergency, and then they might even stay, be hospitalised and stay overnight. We know what the costs are of all those individual things, but the data sets of where the people are coming from. So to me, the future is around better understanding the data, what are the questions you can ask of data, and linkages is one of those. There are quite a few, and I should probably answer five questions, not one for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but still, uh, in terms of actually practically approaching you for that and working out how to, you know, what sets of data are available and what needs to be requisitioned to, to really fill out the story, yep. how do people go about doing that? Um, look, basically, anybody could contact the Institute. We have a general media area. I'm happy to take emails. I'll chuff them off to the right people. But we try and work with anybody who comes to us to try and at the very least explain, here on the website is XYZ data. Because we can always point people at a website and you go nuts trying to find your way through things. Or get the pointers to where to go. Or come and talk about, we would actually like to try and answer these sorts of questions 
Do you have the background and the knowledge in some of your teams that could help us work through some data work? And we're working with WA about burden of disease as it relates to WA. So it's one of the few jurisdictions that has actually taken a step to say, we want to drill into the burden of disease data. So the steps have already been there through the department, but it's not just through the department, it's uh, research bodies and others. There's just a wealth of information. We just aren't good at using the data. Mm. Um, the, the top question here is how can we accelerate timeliness of data sharing from government departments so that it can be used and linked for real-time assessment of what is and isn't working? Uh, look, it's a really good question and it's one we get stung on quite frequently at the um, Institute. Because when you're trying to make data perfect and then you do the analysis and your absolute quality is everything, you don't want an error in your data, you'll wait the next year. So it's the the link between what is wanted for a broad policy consideration can be a first data set with appropriate descriptions. But then the analysis and deep analysis is that's the next year of work. I think what a lot of organisations, us included, tend to do is we do all that as one response. We don't look at the, what's the immediate need with maybe a subset of data and then spend another six months working through. And, and we did that with uh, the suicide rates of veterans last year. We put out an interim report with some basic numbers that we're absolutely sure of, and then the deeper analysis was about six months later. But we don't do that across a lot of what we do. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that is interesting then, because I'd, I'd written down, you know, is it problematic when you were talking about that burden of disease uh, data gathering, that the data was from 2011? Is that, does that detract from, from the strength of what you're gathering? Um, it, a lot depends on the actual situation, so, or the, the subject matter. So burden of disease, there was still you know, there's decades of data around in some areas. So when you come out, you've got a trend line and you can get a ruler almost and look at what the trend will be. Mm -hmm. You're just backing it up with the latest information. Um, so the 2011 hit home that, why is it out of date so early? Um, so that was because there was an international focus on burden of disease and Australia decided to do our own burden of disease to make it more relevant to Australia using Australian data, not a mix with international, so that took longer but then it was the investment straight away to update it. I know that in one of your slides you, you did uh, show some stats on the link between alcohol and domestic violence, but this question I think I will still ask, um, because it's can you comment on the link between alcohol and domestic violence and what it means for public health messaging? Yeah. Um, I think, to me, the bottom line, it's the messaging that's about, um, I'd say, alcohol, domestic violence and homelessness, that the messaging is about the three. The biggest driver of homelessness and the use of homeless services is family domestic violence. The role of alcohol in domestic violence is huge, and it's the crossover of those three. So following those three through and doing some more deep work on that kind of area will be the kind of thing that then can help service delivery and policy. But um, at this stage, we're only able to get sort of high-level data, but it showed enough of the, the links that were in there and the burden of disease cost mm. of only domestic violence. So are you saying then that you need more will to, or more kind of directive to get, to obtain that data and go deeper? And who would you get that from? Uh, well, this is one of the, the fun bits of uh, how far do I jump um, from state jurisdictions. Um, and uh, Commonwealth data sets give access, but we can only use data and then release data in reports when it's been agreed to by the owner. So everything we do weaves a careful line through many, when you talk timeliness, getting agreement from everybody to everything we write. You can imagine what that's like with all the jurisdictions getting common agreement. So access to the data in the first place is great, but then how you write up what that says without it being seen as uh, an implied criticism of a service delivery or a policy is the delicate art of getting data out there. So what we need is the commitment. Uh, that was only funded by um, New South Wales, Victoria, ACT and the Commonwealth were the only jurisdictions that contributed to that work. All jurisdictions were involved in the family domestic violence work, but that, like a lot of others, we'd want to get a, a coalition of the willing to say this is critical and it's important. And again, it's back to, do you want to invest in evidence? Right. Uh, because it, I guess that also links into the, the idea that you were talking about the Institute needing to be and, and really having a mission to be trusted and independent. So how does that, <laughs> that must be one of your bigger challenges in a sense about how you're you know, able to obtain everything that's available collator in a way that it can be um, yep. 
not upsetting anybody. I'll t I won't put the words in your mouth. You tell me. How hard is it to be trusted and independent? Um, I'll give a really recent example. Um, late last year, we put out some data that was about the waiting times, private patients in public hospitals. You can imagine us putting out some information on that state by state. Um, so we'd done early report on that in the middle of the year for the first time. I'm not quite sure why it was the first time. The data's been around, but it is a very sensitive area, quite naturally. And we put out a, some national figures, and then we did some work to say we're going to follow up and do it with um, some jurisdictional breakup. We worked with the technical committees and with all the jurisdictions, and it was a painstakingly methodical process. I was not going to say painful. Um, to work through to make sure that we got the context right. Because every jurisdiction will have a, here is the context for our jurisdiction. But having the evidence out there promotes a debate about what the evidence is saying. And then you move back to the context. So we worked through, rewrote, rewrote, rewrote to get the balance right. But our line is still as an independent entity, we wanted particular data out there. But if we don't get the agreement of each jurisdiction, the data does not get used. Because the only way we can be seen as trusted is not to use data when we haven't got that agreement. So it's that balancing act. So our job was to understand the issues for jurisdictions, but also to drive the agenda around better use of data. And um, we, uh, the report came out, so clearly we got to a, a balanced view in a final document that uh, walked the fine line. OK, because I was going to ask, how does that skew the story? Uh, well, our job is to make sure that we don't see a skewed story. If it, if it went that far, we would not put out a report. If the evidence is, would be seen to be skewed in any way, that section of a report would be removed. So we wouldn't put it out if we didn't think the numbers said X, but people want us to say Y. We stick with what the data story is there. Our job is not to evaluate. As soon as we evaluate or do anything like that, people will stop giving us the data. Mm. Um, so our, we have a noble cause, which is to put the data out there and say, here's the evidence, and raise the conversation from here to here by improving the data and the evidence and hope that those better decisions lead to improved health and wellbeing. So, I mean, you've talked to me about how, how you're a spruker for, for the use of data, and, um, and you are very passionate, it's true. Uh, but how do we improve the data literacy of, of the public and politicians? Um, well, I, I'd add, and at the public sector, mm -hmm. because we don't have the level of capability of data understanding in the public sector either. So, that it should be in individual performance agreements for key people about their capabilities in the use of data or understanding what it can do. For the politicians, um, it's a, a, the balancing act, as always. We know that um, you know, the uh, inconvenient truth that evidence can get in the way of some political views, and the job is, again, it's back to context. You can only provide the evidence and support people to help provide advice. Government's elected to make decisions. But if there's better evidence, then potentially that will help improve the decisions that get made. Mm. In the public arena, it's the social licence. That in small areas, social licence is really strong about the use of data. And I think rare diseases is probably one where families, with, uh, particularly with children, but any family member suffering from a rare disease, knowing that if they can have that data linked to other data sets to find five other people that have a common disease helps. But it's in the broader use of population health and public health where at times we haven't been as good as promoting around the use of various data sets and the, the linkage of data sets is safe and it's secure, it's done in an appropriate way with support from legislation and um, it's, going, you know, it's a national value. Mm. And I think it's very hard for people to stand up sometimes and talk about the national asset of a data set. It just sounds very corny. but. Um, if I wanted to get really in the advocacy role, I'd say, where is it on the balance sheet of a health department to say, actually, the data assets of this department are worth X billion dollars or X hundred million dollars. We have triple bottom line from years ago that was really a driving force about environmental um, accounting. But actually, the value of data can change and does change significantly many things. Folic acid was a really good asset um, uh, example of the debate using data about folic acid in, um, and helping it for uh, preventing deformities. It went through a big debate about the data. Then there was the decision point, policy debate, political debate, public debate, and dare I say it, business debate, because it had to be the flour mills, I think, of Australia that had to be convinced that they had to put it into the bread. Then it was put into the bread. 
And four years later, we did the work that showed significant, not just significant, huge decreases in the level of abnormalities um, of newborns, particularly where the women were young and particularly Indigenous women. Just stark data that said, you know, 12 years of work through data. Interestingly enough, New Zealand didn't do it because they didn't win the decision point. So at that point, they didn't put it into their bread. So um, there are good examples where, you know, the noble world of data played its course. Yeah. Um, you talked earlier about a report that you'd released this week about family and domestic violence, and I wondered how you try to mitigate uh, the media sensationalising certain elements of the data that you're releasing, um, so that the story that gets put out in the media is the story that you actually feel is being told by the data. Um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, well, we don't try and mitigate. Uh, we try and, what well, we do by the way we write it, yeah. But clearly, headline numbers still make for easy, quick headlines. What we did notice with this report, and we put extra emphasis in two areas. One was the report itself provided a lot of data that was already known, but added some new bits. But it also delved into some of the causal effects and burden of disease and the crossovers with alcohol and some other things. And the other thing, we talked more about data gaps and that the absence of data. And then in our media release, we put about a quarter of it into the what needs to be done about the value of data proposition. It wasn't just the statement about data. Mm. But 90% of the coverage would take two or three of the key headlines, depending on which town and which state, and grab those. Mm. But about four different areas. For about the first time, actually queried um, Louise, my uh, group manager on that work, about the data side and the collection of data, how it was collected, and we were just blown away. So, you know, it was only I think it was about four out of 160, 170 media hits through TV, radio, online, newspapers, about four. So, you know, you count your wins where you can, but talked about the evidence trail and the what next. Yeah. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, the primary care sector is vital in promoting health messages. What do we know about the data from that sector? Um, there's a, a lot of data sitting there through GPs around the country but as a national tool or even a state tool, incredibly limited. We used to have the beach report up until about a year and a half, two years ago. It wasn't necessarily anything great. That drew, drew out some data. We have the medical software industry, um, a variety, I can't remember the number, 15 or so that provide the software for doctors. So they're all different software packages. So the data that goes in in GPs is done in different ways across different systems. But there are data um, software packages around that can extract data, both in um, binary form or from text, that could bring it together. We see our job to look at data standards, data definitions, because that's the other thing. Those definitions across all of those different data sets might be slightly different. Um, you know, is this a finger? Is it a digit? Is it a part of a hand? Which way does it get recorded? That's the role we do, metadata standards for the health system. Um, so. For us, it's build the base around definitions and standards, then work at huge stakeholder engagement. The GPs will have different views. Mm. Each state college will probably have different views. The AMA will have different views. But it's like the uh, domestic violence and the um, private patients in public hospitals. Part of our job and expertise is working way through as the independent arbiter, trying to get a common set of standards and definitions and build something that will help whether you guys are still here or in five years somebody else inform you more from the primary healthcare side. And what are the issues around the release of that data as well? Uh, there will be a debate, there is a debate about who owns the data. Is it the individual citizen, is it the GP, is it the software company? Um, more for us to work through. That's, I'd call that one a stretch goal, but it's one that it really, um, if I was to be honest, it should have been something brought up um, five years ago, 10 years ago, through AMAC or something like that to say, here is a, a need, here is a risk to health in Australia. We know the costs are going through the roof. We know that preventative health starts primarily in the primary health area and a range of other areas, that you could get stuff as well as through research. But we actually haven't invested. We, so there's a, an argument of where is our national health information strategy? Of course, I'd say something like that. But where is the strategy that says we've got primary health care, we've got electronic health record, we've got genomics, we've got hospital data, and you keep on stacking up a good dozen different things, where's the national strategy that says, where should we invest first? Where should we bring that together? How will that be managed? 
and then try and have a crack at what is the financial value that can come. And you bring your Treasury and Finance people in and make them part of the conversation and sit down and actually talk about how a national strategy can actually change Australia. We talk about the end outcome of how many billion dollars a year, the fact that it's growing by six and a half, seven percent, you know, X amount above whatever the CPI is. But unless you actually go in and work out, well, where can you get the data to change it? We'll still get the same rebuttals through the central financial systems of, sorry, you don't have enough evidence to, to us to support a particular activity. Sounds like it matters quite a lot to you to get that. Oh, it's, you know, we should have started years ago, but why don't we start now? Yeah. Um, uh, another question, uh, um, oh, hang on, where's that gone? <laughs> I wanted to ask that question. Oh, here we go. Uh, how do we ensure that data is not misused and not collected for the intent of advancing a political agenda? Well, you use independent bodies, of course. Um, but um, I think, uh, look, data is always going to be taken by the user in different ways. You're never going to avoid that. Um, I think number one would be that the way data is done, first of all, needs to be done in a way that people accept is secure and safe. And so with consent models using ethics committees, secure access facilities and so on, there are, there are mechanisms around that can protect that process. But I think in terms of then who uses it, you can't, the whole goal is, I think the major thing, make it all public so that anybody can get to it. So some countries have a really good history of major reports and things are always made public. It might be three months after it's released to government. For us, 99% of our stuff is public and it goes out on the dates we pick. Because as an independent body, that's what we're established to do. But there's plenty of work that's done by departments that get caught within the processes of government. I think UK work and pensions have had quite a history of when they do their research work, there's a time period and then it goes up. So quite rightly, government as they fund different um, inquiries and research, want to see the results and want to work out how to respond. But there's a greater good of other users being given access to things. Um, Barry, I'll just ask you one final question. Um, uh, Population-wide national dietary intake data is ad hoc and irregular. Are there moves to collect dietary data more frequently to help guide policy practice? Um, I'd love to say there was. Um, the debate would be where do you get the dietary data? Um, I nearly said it about five minutes ago. I would love to have a relationship with the big supermarkets as a body protected under legislation and the access to our data is protected under legislation to work with them to look at um, data sets around what goes through mm. the supermarkets and marry that up with what we know from our other health related work and tie that in with burden of disease work, not to create a headline about a particular decision that could or, or could not be made by government, but to try and get evidence about some of the things that are there. The banks can do the same. If you look at the data that comes out of credit cards, there's some fascinating stuff. If you go into um, the expenditure patterns across credit cards for um, fast food outlets, it's all there sitting in the data sets, and I've seen some of those. And you can identify age groups by who the card owner is. You don't know whether a card owner who might be a 24-year-old male was buying those four burgers for himself or for four, three mates. Um, but you have an evidence trail of where the, the big outlets are. You could cross map that sort of stuff against the obesity data that we have. Again, it probably is not going to give you an aha moment. But you start following through certain things that can help inform decision making about what might be done in a broader population health area. That'd be a pretty good starting point. Yeah. Yeah, so access to evidence is absolutely there. We just need to get the, the will behind us to actually start making a difference in these areas. Barry Sanderson, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry and Mary. Guys, we've got um, a short break now. We'll be back at 10.45. If anyone's having trouble with Slido, please come over to the corner over here if you want a bit of help. Or if you don't have a device with you, we can also give you pen and paper to do it the old-fashioned way. Just be warned, the, the next session is very meaty, so get that coffee or whatever you need to sustain you into the, into the next session. We'll see you back at 10.45. <laughs>